not just look at the church and say, was there a time where this was more full? Let's be honest. Was there a time I was more full with the Holy Spirit? Was there a time where I allowed the Holy Spirit more control over my life? Was there a time where I was more influenced by God and God's word and God's truth and God's direction than I am today? I was running so well. What happened? Here's what happens. Who prevented you from being, persu uh, being persuaded regarding the truth? This persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. It doesn't come from God. If you were running a godly race, if you were doing the right things, if the church was doing the right things, what happened is we allowed the world to influence us. We stopped listening. We stopped letting this be our guide. We stopped letting this be our truth. We, let, we stopped letting this be the thing that we lived and died, and every breath was off of this. And we started listening to the culture and the world. And our churches started to dwindle, and people started to leave, and families started to break up, and divorces start to go up. And, and, and now we're in a world where people are more confused about their sexual identity than any time in history. I mean, we've had some weird history times. People are more confused now. You could go through all history. There have been times where there was people who wondered if they boys should be girls, girls should be boys. There was homosexuality. There was all of that throughout the whole course of time. It was going on biblically. But never more of a time where people have been more concerned about their self-identity than ever before. What has happened is we've listened to the world. Oh, so what? You're five years old, and so you like playing with dolls. Well, then you must... So what, you were born a boy, you must want to be a girl, and let's get you this surgery, and let's give you hormones, and let's... We're confused. And I shared with you last week, confusion doesn't come from God. We were running so well, but we've been persuaded by the world. And it's not... And these people are just so messed up. They're so messed up that right now we have more young people who are think, thinking about taking their life than at any other time in history. And the sad thing, it's young girls... They're lost, their identity, they don't, they're, 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 they're just, it's just, they're hopeless. We have more mental issues going on. We have more people addicted to some kind of mental health drug than at any time in history. What has happened is we've got away from the truth. We've got away from the one who calls us. We've got away from the true voice, the still small voice, the voice of Jesus Christ. We've got away from it. A little leaven gets in and wrecks the whole batch. It messes us up. And we have allowed it because we make choices to either serve or follow. The song said, I make a choice to be set apart. I love to be set apart. Have you made that choice? Has this church made this choice? Or are we just going to continue to allow sin change our lives and change our church and control our church? Or are we going to step up and we're going to start to say, you know what, we got issues and we're going to be honest, we're going to be real, we're going to be genuine, we're going to repent of our sins. We're going to get on the knees in front of the church altar. We're going to lay our, we're going to lift our hands up. We're going to surrender to God. We're going to confess that we're a broken people. We're going to admit that we're sinners. We're going to admit that we're wrong. We're going to admit that we've left our first love. We're going to admit that we have hurt. We're going to admit that we have shame. We're going to admit that we have unforgiveness. We're going to admit that there's problems in our life. And the only answer that we have is Jesus Christ. And until we do that, we're going to continue to listen to the wrong voice. We're going to continue to be influenced by the wrong people. And the church will continue to dwindle and shrink and shrink and shrink until we say enough is enough. We talk about this. We've talked about the Asbury revival going on. Revival doesn't, you don't have to travel to Asbury College to get revival. Revival starts right here, right now, in your heart, in your life. When you do what we said in that song, you make a choice, you make a decision, you say, here I am, God. Use me. I'm going to be a vessel for you. I was running well, but I've changed. What has happened to the country? What has happened when somebody who goes in and, and this, this person who has mental illness goes in with a gun and kills six Christian people and we are more concerned about the pronoun of the person who killed these people than we're worried about the people who died? What is wrong with us? When most of the news outlets are going, you guys, how dare you call her her? She self-identifies as a guy. And look, I'm not trying to make this just about transgender. That's not the point. The point is sin gets in and it changes the way we see things. As I talked about last week, we start to live in darkness. And the more you move away from the light, the more you go into darkness. And the more you're in darkness, the less you see of the truth. 
And when you don't see the truth, you become part of the darkness. What happens? We were running so well. Look what it says. Be careful that no one takes you captive through philosophies and empty deceit based on human tradition. Stop getting caught up by these worldly beliefs and these worldly concepts and these worldly ideas. If you want to base anything on anything, you base it on this. This is the truth. From Jesus says, I'm the beginning, I'm the end, I'm the alpha, the omega. I I'm, I'm, will always be. I am, I was, and I always will be. This is the truth. If you want to base your life on something, be careful that you don't go to the philosophies of the world and the beliefs of the world and start listening to the news and start listening to college professors. We've messed up our whole educational system, basing it off of philosophies of man instead of philosophies and beliefs of the Bible. That's what has happened, and that's what Paul's getting across. He's saying... The church has been impacted by sin, and you have to do something about it. You have to make a choice. The church needs to be diligent about purging out this yeast, this sin. The Bible talks about leaven being sin. It says yeast in Exodus um, chapter 12, the, 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 the feast of the unleavened bread as it's going to lead into the Passover feast. And some of you are very familiar with the Passover. Some of you not so familiar when, when the children, when Pharaoh was, was enslaving all the children, Jesus was going to go through and he was going to slay the firstborn. And so they were supposed to put blood over their doorposts and there was a whole process for that. But before that process took place, what he wanted them to do was to have this go into their house and clean their house of all leaven, get out all this because it represented, it was symbolic of sin. And he wanted them to get it all out of their life. And they were supposed to do this for seven days before he wanted them to think about it and purposely search. It tells us that they are to search all the corners and they are supposed to get out all of this sin, this yeast out of their, out of their lives, out of their houses. If anyone eats something leaven, that person, whether a foreign resident or a native of the land must be cut off from the community of Israel. Paul is saying almost the same thing here in Corinthians. He says, look, if there's someone in your church who is blatantly sinning, we went through this process of how to try to have reconciliation. We've talked about this a few times. There's a way to do it individually, and there's a way a church deals with people who are in sin. And we've gone through that whole process, so, and we don't have time to do that today. But what he said was if they ultimately don't want to repent, if they ultimately don't want to leave, then we let them go into the world, let them live the life of, of Satan in the world, and hopefully they'll be like the prodigal son. They'll come to their senses and they'll return to the church and ask for forgiveness and come back into the grace of the Father. But if they don't, you cast them out. You just let them go. You let them do their thing. And that's what was going on even back then. Do not eat anything leavened, eat unleavened bread, do, or do not uh, eat unleavened bread in all your homes. Eat unleavened bread. Don't eat anything with sin in it. Don't let that penetrate your life. And this was important. Now, again, I read you in Colossians. You know, I get some people sometimes say, why don't we celebrate this feast of unleavened bread? Because the feast of unleavened bread, the feast of Passover, and, and Jew, um, the Jews for Christ, They'll come into your church, and if you've never had them, it's, it's a great thing to do uh, the Passover meal, and they'll do the Seder, and they'll set everything up, and they'll go through and explain the meaning of each thing. It's very cool. But we are not required to do that today. Why? Because that was all foreshadowing of what Christ was going to do on the cross for you and I. He did it. We don't have to do it. We do everything now in remembrance, and Really, our ordinance is our Lord's Supper and believers' baptism. And so we don't have to do those things. But as individuals, even as we look when we take the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Supper, remember, and I share this almost every time we do Lord's Supper, it's important that we examine ourselves through the power of the Holy Spirit and get rid of any of that sin that, that has crept in because we've gone astray. The church must keep this festival, not, not physically, but spiritually, we need to make sure that we are cleansing ourselves, that we're dealing with issues. When there is a problem in the church, again, I've told you, a lot of people get uncomfortable when there's an issue, when there's got to be confrontation. 
We're not comfortable with that. We'd rather run, we'd rather pretend, we'd rather ignore, and we'd rather not deal with it. But if we don't, it just continues to become a problem. A little, little leaven just wrecks the whole batch, right? And so we need to be careful to make sure that we are addressing issues and we're being honest, we're being real. When there's something going on in the church that we need to confront or that we need to address, there's a scriptural and a biblical way to do it. We're not to attack that a person, but we are to address the sin. And we, there's, a, there's a right way and a wrong way of doing it. But see, the unleavened bread, it just symbolized the necessity for you and I, the believer, that we need to be ready right now. And that was, that was the whole thing of this festival of unleavened bread. The Passover was getting ready to happen. Jesus was, or God, God was going to, the Spirit was going to go through, and all those firstborn were going to be killed in Egypt, right? And then Pharaoh was going to be upset, and the people of Egypt were going to be upset, and they were going to drive out Moses and the, and the children of Israel, right? And so God told him, you need to be ready. You need to be ready to go. Because when this happens, man, these people are going to be upset. They're going to be hurt. They're going to be angry. And sure enough, when that happens, Pharaoh says, you get your people out of Dodge right now. I don't even want to see your face. You need to be ready to go. You and I, the Bible says, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, you and I, we don't know when Christ is going to return. I believe we're closer than ever. You look at the signs. You look at the Bible. You look at what's going on. Man, we need to be ready. You and I need to be ready. And not just because Christ might not come. He may not come back today. But you don't know how long you have. I don't know how long I have. Something may happen to us this very day, no matter how healthy we think we are. And we need to be ready. And the way we're ready is we have our hearts set on God and focused on God. There's little time before the judgment of God falls upon the world. We need to be ready. The church needs to tell the world about this. We need to be ready. Now concerning the day and the hour, no man knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, except for the Father only. This is why you also must be ready, because the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Are you ready? Are you prepared? Are you set? Do you know where you're going if Christ returns right now? Do you know where you're going to go if you were to pass from this world? Do you know? Is your eternal security set? Are you ready? So another lesson, the church must, be re uh, must not be of, they must be in this world, but not of the world. Just like that church that I told you in Kansas City, we have to, in this whole series, it's been talking about we are in the world, but we're not of the world. We need to set the standards. How do you live your life? Do you live it according to God's word? How do you live on Sunday? Not just Sunday. How are you living on Monday? How are you living on Wednesday? How are you living when the world's starting to pressure you? It's one thing to praise God here on Sunday when everybody else is doing it. What about when you're in the midst of a world that nobody else is praising God? Can you still praise him? Do you still focus on him? Are you really, truly ready? See, we got to hold ourselves to a higher standard not just as a church, but again, as individuals. Do not love the world or the things that belong to the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. You know, and I get people ask all the time, Pastor, how far can I go before God's going to be upset with me? You're asking the wrong question. If that's what you're trying to do, if you're trying to live that close to the edge how far to the edge of the cliff can I get over is really what you're asking. There's a cliff that, that's just going to fall down, and if you fall over that cliff, it's death. How far can I get to that edge of that cliff before there's destruction? That's not the question to ask. The question isn't, how far can I go before God is going to be upset with me? The question should be, how do I get closer to God that I don't even care about where the edge is? I want to be so entrenched into the kingdom of God and his love and his word and in the center of his will that nothing else even matters. That I don't want to know how far I could go. The question now becomes, what do I need to do to get more of Jesus in my life? 
How do I get closer to him? Don't love the world. You know, if you, if you ask the question, and, and people ask this all the time, am I truly saved? I can't answer that. I could say, well, yeah, you went through baptism. Yeah, you went through our new believers class. Yeah, you, you seem to come to church on a regular basis. None of those things save me. Getting dunked back there doesn't save you. Those are going through the motions. It's do you have a love for God? Are you hungry for his word? You were running so well. What distracted you? The world. For everything that belongs to the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride in one's lifestyle, it's not from the Father, but it is from the world. And the world is the devil, and it's from the devil, and he is the father of lies. He will never tell you the truth. He may persuade it to where it looks like the truth, but it's never the truth. He's a liar. And the world with its lust is passing away. Get this. But the one who does God's will remains forever. You were running so well, what happened? The church was running so well, what happened? We need to make a choice. You have a choice. We're wrapping it up right here. This is it. But before you leave here this morning, you make a choice. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. What is your choice? You choose. You were running so well. What happened? What distracted you? The world gets you, gets you off track. And trust me, it's easy. I'm not standing up here. Folks, I, I stand up here a broken sinner just like you. I, I'm not standing here. I, I, I don't like the word preacher. I don't like the word preaching. I've told you when I came here the first day, I love the way that Billy Graham put it. I'm one beggar telling another beggar where to get bread. That's all. We're all broken in some way, some shape, some form. Jesus is the master physician. I'm not standing up here telling you, look, you guys be like me. I'm perfect. I, I live a great life. Well, we've been married 38 years. We have the best marriage in the world. Man, we struggle just like you. I struggle every day. I go into the business place, and I have to make decisions. And I'm confronted with making a decision to make my company happy or make my people happy or make myself happy or do I make God happy. I have to make those choices and decisions every day. What choice will you make? You were running so well. If you would, bow your heads, close your eyes. Father, I know there's someone in here like me, at some time, some place, maybe even right now, if they're real, if they're honest with you, they were running so well. They were on target. They were on fire for you. But the pressures, the stress, the world, the responsibilities just distracted them. The world just pulled them away from you. And a decision needs to be made today. Will you choose to return to your first love? Will you surrender your life to the Father? Lord, I pray that they would make that decision to return today. Father, there may be somebody in who has never received you as Lord and Savior. Father, I pray that you speak to their heart right now, that you let them know that you love them.
because your Bible, your word tells us that over and over and over again. The cross proved that love, that yet while we were yet sinners, you died for us. What greater love than to die for the person who is basically your enemy? Father, I pray that that individual, if they don't know you, today would be the day that they would say, Dear Jesus, come into my heart, into my life. I've been living my own way, doing the things that I want to do, the way I want to do them. It hasn't worked out so well. I want to start living your way. I want to know more about you. I want to know more about the Bible. I want to know more about what this baptism thing is he talked about. I want to know more about how to live a godly life. And I pray that it starts right here, right now. I give you my life. I ask you to be my Lord, my Savior. I repent of my sin. I, I, I ask forgiveness. I don't want to live that selfish individual life any longer. I want to live for you. Come and be my Lord and be my Savior. The Bible says if you ask God that right now, you've been saved. All of heaven is rejoicing. We'd love to tell you more about the next steps. We'd love to tell you more about believer's baptism. Get you set up for those things. Talk to us after the service and we will help you in the steps you need to take. I pray that no one leaves here without making a choice. Get back to running the race. Surrender your life today. Father, I pray that this church would start running well again. That it would be a place that would influence this community instead of the community influencing us. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for speaking to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you would, please stand. And
Father, may that be our desire as we leave here today, that we would choose to be holy, that we would choose to be set apart for you, that our desire would be to do your will. Thank you for bringing us together today, Father. We love you. Embrace this church family as they go their individual ways today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Have a blessed day. Good job. Awesome job.